And we could ask the question, would Paul bind the church to read the scriptures? And undoubtedly they would. And so what I want to say is this. I want to take that, that verse here. Paul says, I put you under oath <coughs> before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. And I want to take that, brethren, and apply it to us in a broader scope and say, I put you under oath, brethren. You have this book read, all of you. And so that's what I want us to consider. I don't have authority to bind you to any other book. I don't have authority to bind you to anything I have said. I just finished, you know, we, we, I just finished, and all of you have been messaging about uh, right there on the website of all the sermons that are there that you can go and listen to. I can't bind any of you to say, you better go listen to that. But I can say to you, you better go and read this book. Right? And so listen. Let me say one more thing here before we just begin to break this verse down. This is an important thing, I think. I, I didn't intend to... To talk about this, but I think it's it's useful. Why do you think Paul is having the church read the letter openly? He why why do you think Paul in another another verse that kind of says this? Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 4:13, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Why does Paul say that? Why does Paul say here, have the, this letter read to all the brothers? Why do you think Paul's saying that to the church? What, why is the need for it? Sure. Yeah. Why, why would they need to read it, though, so that everyone has it and hears it? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. So My questions aren't as specific as they need to be. <laughs> they don't have yeah, okay. Nicolette said something along those lines too. This is, this is it, brethren. These people, listen. <coughs> We've talked about this before. Remember, we did the Bible study in how we got our Bibles. And you know what, brethren? These people didn't have their own Bibles. They didn't have the Scriptures for themselves. Paul is wanting them to read the Scriptures publicly so that people can hear them, so that people can know what God has said. Brethren, people didn't have this book at home where they could go out front in their porch swing as sun is rising and read their nicely bound Bible and have a nice cup of coffee like we can have. They didn't have it. They didn't have the Bible like we had it. It was expensive. It took time. Just like Nicolette said, many people couldn't even read. Even if they had it, they wouldn't have been able to even know what it said. And so Paul is charging them, you would better have this letter read to all the brothers because this is for all of them, right? He wants them to know this is a word for the church. Don't you take it and go hide it over here. You know, the Catholic Church did for, for centuries. Oh, we're going to hide the word. You people don't get to read it. No, Paul says you better have it read. These people need to know what it says. It's for their good. It's for their benefit. All through here in 1 Thessalonians, telling the church, encourage one another with these words. Well, how are they going to do it unless they know the words, right? How are they going to encourage one another unless they know them? And so Paul is telling the church, you need to have this thing read publicly so they know the word, so they know what it's good for. There's this constant emphasis always upon hearing, hearing the scriptures. You know, James says it, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Now, typically we read that and we apply it to ourselves. I was just talking about this with Baumlock the other day. How, how do we... Some verses, it's like it's just, it's just broad application. It means the same for everybody. Sometimes it's a particular application, and then we come over here and we see how it applies to us. This is one where I think we just automatically make the application, which is fine. But James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know what, brethren? This isn't about just hearing it in your head as you sit at the dinner table reading your Bible. James is talking about you're coming to the meeting place. You're hearing the word, literally. You're hearing it. And then he's saying, now you better go out and you do it, right? So that's the idea. It's, it's in the midst of God's people. You hear the word, and then you do the word. Don't just be hearers, but be doers. Revelation 1.3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear. Again, this is, this is public reading. 
public hearing. They're needing to do this for God's people. And so my point is this. If Paul would put the church under an oath to have the letter read in the midst of God's people because they didn't have them, what do you think Paul would say to a church like this where, not, brethren, we have God's word, do we not? In quantities, mass. We don't just have one sort of poorly copied book that's fallen apart with a couple letters of the New Testament and maybe like Jeremiah and half of Isaiah. We have the whole thing in one book that you can pick up and carry around. And not only do you all have this, all of you, except for the little children, have, have this thing which has like every Bible imaginable on it. And you know what, brethren? We have all this stuff. What do you think Paul would say to a church like ours that has Bibles innumerable? Well, undoubtedly, he'd probably still tell them, you read it publicly. There's something, something about that. That the Word of God needs to be read publicly, heard publicly, but undoubtedly, and maybe even more so, He would exhort these people, Brethren, read your Word. Read the book. I mean, God's given it to you. Do you ever think about that? I mean, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but brethren, I often just sit in, in, in the mornings praying like, Lord, you kept this book. I mean, you, you gave us a book and you kept it all these years. 2,000 years ago, this thing was written. And God has kept it and preserved it all this time. And here I am, uh, you know, 2,000 something years later, and I get to read it. And it's all put together. I don't got to go find it in all these different places. So, brethren, we have it in our hands. You have something that most Christians throughout the centuries would have never even dreamed of being able to have. And you know what? You don't have to anticipate all week to go and hear the word. You know, you imagine the Christians in the early church. It's like they, they you know, a letter comes in. Oh, Paul sent us a letter. And all the Christians are thinking, oh, wow, can't wait till we get to hear what Paul has said to the church. And they don't know. They, they just, they, you know, the word's kind of gone around in the church. Oh, when we gather on Sunday, you know. Pastor so-and-so is going to read the new letter from Paul. And they have no idea what it says. And they got to wait all week to hear what Paul said to the church. Brother, you don't have to do that. You get to read it every day. You can read it multiple of times a day. You know, some of these books, you can read them in like 20 minutes. These people had to wait all week to hear 1 Thessalonians. And you can read it every single day. Every day. Brethren, store it up. I mean, store this word up. And so here's, what, here's how I want to break this down then. I want to sort of underline three different phrases here. The first one is before the Lord. Second one is this letter. And the last one will be all the brothers. So the first phrase, Paul says, I put you under oath before the Lord. That's our first phrase. And the matter of interest here for us, right out of the gate, is this. It's the who. Not the who of to whom the letter is written, and not the who concerning who's writing the letter, but the who concerning before whom Paul puts them under oath. He says, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read. And here's the idea. Paul puts them under oath because it is the Lord who has all authority. He, he is binding them by the authority of Jesus Christ himself to have this letter read. He doesn't say, I put you under oath by my own position. Even Paul himself, brethren, you know this. Paul himself, even as an apostle of the living God, is limited in his authority. He can't just proclaim anything he wants. He has authority given to him by God, by the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, I put you under oath because of what your parents say or what your parents want. He doesn't say, I put you under oath by what your pastors say. He says, I put you under oath before the Lord. And this is the reason. He places them under oath to have this letter read and their, in, in our application to all the scriptures. Because what he's doing by saying that is putting the authority upon Jesus Christ as though Jesus Christ Himself is saying to the church, you have this letter read. It's as though God Himself is saying to them, you have this letter read. And this is of particular importance for us 
because of this. This is the very reason why we ought to give ourselves to reading this book. Brethren, it's God's book. I'm not up here telling you, although, although there might be usefulness in all kinds of other books in the world, I'm not telling you, you better read that. We're telling you, you need to read this. And the reason is, is because it's God's book. He wrote this book for you. He places them under oath before the Lord to read this book because ultimately they are the Lord's words. They're His words and therefore He puts them under oath under Him to say, you read the Lord's words. God Himself is speaking to us in this book. Yes, brethren, Paul wrote a lot of it. Moses wrote a lot of it. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, James, John, Peter. I mean, all these people, they contributed to this book. But who is behind all of this? God is behind all of this. Brethren, I mean, let me ask you this. This might be a trick question, but <laughs> are these the words of men? Yes. <laughs> I knew it was a trick question. <laughs> Listen, they are the words of men, but they are not merely the words of men. Listen to this. Remember this. When you get the atheist out there that wants to tell you that's a book written by men. Well, you just quote him 1 Peter or 2 Peter 1:21. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Is it a book from men? Yes. But is it a book from merely men? No. No. Right? Who spoke? Well, Men spoke. That's what it says here. Men spoke from God. So men spoke. Who gave them the words? God gave them the words. And how was it related to the people? The Spirit of God gave it to them. Men spoke. God gave them the words. The Spirit of God leads them along as they write these words to us. You remember the words of the, our Lord to the disciples. You can look at this. Luke chapter 10. Luke 10, 16. <clears throat> he says to them, the one who hears you, hears me. And the one who rejects you, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. So you see what's happening here. Jesus is telling these early apostolic witnesses that if the people reject what they have to say, they not only reject the Messiah, the Christ, they, but they reject God Himself. You see this? He says, you speak for me. If they reject you, they reject me. And not only do they reject me, they reject God. So this is because the words that they spoke and the words that are now written down for us in this book are God's words. And many other passages, brethren, could be brought out. Much more of this reality can be seen. But you know this. If you are a Christian, you know this. You know these to be God's words. Do you not? And it's not that you know them to be God's words because someone proved it to you with a hundred different proofs. You know it to be God's word because God Himself has testified to you that it's God's word. No one's going to go around convincing people that these are God's words. That is a testimony of the Spirit of God Himself. You believe that because God has put that in you. Not because you had sufficient evidence, but because God Himself testifies to you that they are His words. Listen, brethren, did Jesus not say, My sheep hear my voice? Did He say that? Brethren, do you hear it? Do you know it to be the voice of the shepherd? Listen, do you realize... How unbelievably glorious it is that God has done this. God, I mean God, the creator of the universe. He's the God of all power, the God of all wisdom, the God of all knowledge. He is the one true God who needs nothing. He gains nothing from people. And brethren, that God wrote you a book. The God of all creation. The God who just spoke and things came into existence. He actually wrote you a book, brethren. God wanted you to know 
who He is, what He has done. God wanted you to know His purpose in redemption. All of His glorious acts that He has done throughout history on behalf of His people. How much love He has shown to a rebellious and backward people. The fact that He gave up His only Son for you and how He will indeed come again to take you with Him. Brethren, God wrote you a book to say all of that. And you know what, folks? It took him a really long time to write it. I mean, you think about this. A man might write a book for his children. He might write an autobiography of sorts, kind of telling them about what his life was like and all the things that he experienced. But let me ask you this. If it was going to take that man 1,500 years to write that book, you think he'd write it? Probably not. And God, God took a long time to write you this book. God patiently worked through men to bring you the words that are here. And folks, He didn't write it for Himself. God knows who He is. He wants you to know who He is. He wrote it for you. Maybe none of you have ever written a book for another person. Have you ever written a letter? Who has written a letter to another person? I thought about this when I was preparing this. I'm like, I don't know, maybe some of, the, some of you haven't ever written a letter. Like a long text. You ever written a long text to someone <laughs> that you really cared about and you really wanted them to know certain things? That it contained important information maybe that you desperately wanted this person to know? Brother, and how would you feel? If you came to find out that when that person you wrote that letter to, they began to read it, got halfway through, stuck it in their dresser drawer and said, nah, not really that interested anymore. But then you imagine a man, he's away at war, and he writes his dear wife a letter telling her how much he loves her, recalling all of their life together up until that point. And he comes to find out, he comes home, his wife didn't even get his letter read through. He asks, why didn't you read it? I wrote you that letter, why didn't you, write, why didn't you read my letter? She says, I just didn't have time. I don't have enough time to read your letter. I mean, brother, you didn't have time? I'm on the battlefield out here, I wrote you this letter, you didn't have time to even read it? Poured out my heart to you. You couldn't even find enough time to read it. Listen, is that, brethren, you tell me, is that an abominable thing or not? That is, is it not? Now let me ask you this. Folks, are you the woman? Has God written you this beautiful book and you give excuse after excuse after excuse as to why you do not read it? Brethren, you remember, you stand before the Lord God Himself and He sees your heart. He knows what you think. What would you say about a husband or wife who doesn't care to hear what their spouse has to say? They don't take time to listen to them. They don't converse with them. They don't hear about how their day went. You tell me, is that love? I, it's not love. You better believe it's not. And brethren, if you wouldn't call that love, I ask you this, why is it that Christians so often, they continue to want to to just profess so loudly their love for God. I love God! And yet they do not listen to what He has to say. They don't read His book. God went through all this work to give you this book. And yet Christians, day after day after day, they profess their love for God and they don't even read what He's written to them. <clears throat> Folks, do you know who it is, the Scripture says, that the Lord will look to, that, that look of affection, that look of love. Isaiah 66, 2, undoubtedly many of you know this verse. This is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. I mean, do you tremble at the word, brethren? Job said it. Listen to this. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. I mean, can you say it? 
Can you say with Job, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my food? The psalmist, 119.14, In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. 119.103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. 119.127, Therefore I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. I mean, you go read this psalm. It's like unending. It's unending. The psalmist is just in, in love with God's words, what he has said to God's people. Jeremiah felt it. Listen to this. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me a joy and a delight of my heart. You see that? Jeremiah eats it. It's a joy. It's a delight. He loves the Lord's words. Brethren, are you eating? Are you eating these words like Jeremiah was? Did our Lord not quote it in his temptation? What did he say to the devil? Man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Is it true for you, brethren? Do you live on just the physical food? Or do you live on the spiritual food? Do you live on the words that come from the mouth of God? You know, the Lord quoted that. Because he lived that way. Look at this. I want you to see this verse. Isaiah 50. Brethren, he knew what it was to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Isaiah 54 and 5. I'm going to read this here from the New American Standard I think the, uh, <laughs> amen. Michael just bought an ESV soon recently, and now I'm reading from the NASB. <laughs> but, but the point is the same regardless of what translation, of course. But I think there's a particular word here, how they translate it, that I think is, is helpful. So here's what it says, verse 4 and 5. The Lord God has given me the tongue of disciples so that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. So you see this, day by day, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's giving His ear to the Father. He's being taught of the Father. He's living by the words of the Father. Every word that proceeds from His mouth. Brethren, He had something to share because He's going to the Father for teaching. Many have said it before. Brethren, He had the tongue of a disciple because He had the ear of a disciple. Living day by day every word from the Father's mouth. Like Jeremiah, He was eating the words and they were delightful to Him. Listen, here's a man. He goes to the hospital. He's very, very sick. He, he shows up. His body's shutting down. He can't, even, he can't even step on the scale. can't even talk to the doctors about his condition. And so his wife talks to them. They ask. They begin to ask his wife, As, was your husband out of the country recently? I mean, did he have some kind of reaction to medication or to food? What's the issue here? Nothing is making sense as to why this guy is in such a sickly condition. And then finally, his wife sort of says in passing to the doctors that the guy hasn't eaten in two months. And the doctor looks at him absolutely in shock. He hasn't eaten in two months. But the man and his wife don't seem to be bothered by it. It doesn't even seem to affect them. Two months this man hasn't eaten, he says. And the wife looks at him with confusion. Yeah, so what? He hasn't eaten in two months. What's the problem, doc? And the doctor tells the woman, listen, the cause of your husband's sickness is that he hasn't eaten in two months. That's why he's so sick. You wonder why the guy can't even stand up. He can't even talk. He hasn't eaten in two months. She doesn't seem convinced. In fact, she's even a bit offended. How could you possibly tell me such a simple remedy? So there they go. They're angry. They leave the hospital. They go try to find some other doctor that will give them different advice other than go home and eat. Brethren, what did I just describe to you? I just described to you the life of 
many a Christian. Many a Christian. They don't eat the Word, and therefore they wonder why they are so weak. They don't eat the Word, and they wonder why they are in such a poor condition. Brethren, you'd better believe. You go to the Word, you begin eating, you start to get your belly full a little bit, you do that over and over and over again. One thing I will promise you is that you will find the strength of the Lord returning to you. Amen. you got to go to that Word. you got to eat. Don't wonder why you're in such a poor condition if you're not eating. Brethren, do not be deceived. What is the, I mean, the Bible says this over and over and over again. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Why is it telling us that, folks? Because people can be and are deceived. They think something's true, and it's not true. Brethren, don't be deceived. Jesus said, if you, listen, this is the if, if you abide in my words, what does he say? You are truly my disciple. What's the flip side? What is it if you don't abide in his word? You're not truly his disciple, right? If you abide in my words, you're truly my disciple. If you don't abide in my words, you're not truly my disciple. You might claim to be one, but he says you're not truly one. Brethren, you remember, Michael read it, the words of Peter. He says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk. You know how it is for an infant, <laughs> right? They want to eat, they want to eat, right? And you know what they want, right? They want milk, and they want it right now. Don't you wait. Brethren, this is how Peter says it. You had better desire. You should have, as God's people, you got the Spirit of God in you that cries, Abba, Father. you got the Spirit of God in you that cries, Milk, milk! Spiritual food! Give it to me! I'm hungry for it! They desire the Word. And then he says that by it, the Word, you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. You see that? If indeed. Right? You desire it. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good. But you know what you won't desire if you haven't tasted it? You, said, you know, when we, my wife got married, there were a lot of things that she did not like to eat. <laughs> well, she thought she didn't like to eat them. And then once I had her taste them, she thought, oh, I do like to eat that. And that's how it is with the word, brethren. You taste it and you realize, this is good. This is God's word. This is good for me. And you know what? You taste it and you want it. You taste it and you eat it. You taste it and it's good and you say, I want more of that. It's good for the soul. Brethren, long for it. Eat. Eat the words. Brethren, this is a banquet. I mean, it's a buffet. Just lined up. You go take whatever you want. Take a little Jeremiah. Next morning, take a little, you know, little revelation if you're feeling, <laughs> feeling lively. You know, the word is there, though, brother. It's for you to take and eat, for you to rejoice in. God's written you this glorious book. Find joy in it. Now go back. If, you're, if you've moved away from 1 Thessalonians, go back there again. The next phrase here. I put you under oath, Paul says, before the Lord to have this letter read. So the next thing is this. Paul says, read this letter. This is the one you need to read. He doesn't say, I put you under oath, have Plato or Aristotle or Socrates or any other philosopher read. He doesn't say, I put you under oath, have Herodotus or Thucydides or Xenophon or any other historian read. He doesn't say, I put you under oath, have Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey or the Epic of Gilgamesh or any other fiction or poetry read. He doesn't say, I put you under oath, have Gamaliel or Hillel or any other commentator of the Scriptures read. Brethren, he says, I put you under oath, have this letter read. You see, there's a lot of things in this world, brethren, that you could read that you could give yourself to. And I'm not even saying any of those things are wrong or sinful, but I am saying this, what are you spending your time reading? Are you spending your time reading the other things? Brethren, there's a lot of things you could read. But this book is of infinite value for you to read. Why would you give yourself more to other things to read? Listen, many of you have probably heard it. It's one of the, probably one of the favorite things I think I ever heard Bob say in a message. But brethren, the book of Hebrews calls God's word the sword of the Spirit. 
Brethren, there's nothing else like it in this world. There is nothing else like this book in this world. Do you remember the words of David? He's there in, uh, I think it's Nob. And, he, and he, he comes up to Ahimelech and he asks him for a sword or a spear and he tells him, I got the sword of, of Goliath here. And what does David say? Oh, there's none like it. Give it to me. Brethren, and that's how we need to be with the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. There is none like it, brethren. Is that your cry? This is, there's none like this. Give it to me. Again, there's a lot of things you could give yourself to read. And now I recognize, maybe a lot of those things I just listed, you don't even know what they are. But you know what? Paul knew what they were. All of those things that I had just listed a moment ago were famous authors or writings in the days of Paul. And a lot of people spent a lot of their time reading that stuff. They read the philosophers. They read the commentators. They read the, the fiction books. They read the poetry. They read all those things. Brethren, Paul did not tell them, I bind you, you read that. And I recognize you may not spend all of your time reading Herodotus or Socrates. But you know what? Undoubtedly, many of you do spend much more time reading other things than reading this book. Brethren, you spend more time reading the internet or the news than you do spend reading this book. Do you spend more time reading useless and possibly even ungodly fiction stories than you do spending time reading this book? Do you spend more time reading people talking about the book than you do reading the book? Christians can get into that a lot, brethren. They can read books about the Bible, and they don't read the Bible. I remember, and he, Aaron can testify to this as an absolute truth. Brethren, I remember I was when I took a couple of classes in seminary, and I would email people and try to talk about some things. I found out a lot of those people in seminary, they don't read their Bible, brethren. They don't even read their Bible. You know why? Because they spend all their time reading books about the Bible. They don't even read the Bible. Brethren, that's a shame. You're spending more time reading the God-forsaken Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever other social media things there are than reading the book? Brethren, give yourself to the pure, holy Word of God. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. You know what, brethren? All those things listed are in this book. Things worthy of praise, things that are pure, things that are honorable, things that are commendable, things that are lovely, things that are just, things that are excellent, things that are worthy of praise. It's all here. It's all here, brethren. Give yourself to it. Think on these things. Read these things. This, folks, is the letter of letters. It is the book of books. It is the song of songs. It is the holy of holies. Brethren, this is the book that can take a man from hell and bring him to heaven. This is the book, brethren. It's a blueprint for life. The psalmist says, it's a lamp to my feet. You want a lamp for your feet in a dark place? Bob used to say, it's a road map for heaven. <laughs> and that's true, brethren. It's a road map for heaven. I remember when I was young, my parents took us to Disneyland. And it's somewhat of a vague memory, but I do remember this. They had this big giant map, you know, in the car. <laughs> it's like my, my stepdad's holding this map and they're trying to look at, you know, we got to take this exit or we got to go to this place or whatever. Maybe, you know, we don't really do that anymore. But, but I remember that. And you know what? Brethren, the Word of God, it needs to be used in a very similar manner. Folks, you don't want to take a wrong turn, you better consult the Word. You don't want to end up with regrets and confusion, you better consult the Word. You don't want to make a poor decision, you better consult the Word. I've seen many men and women walk out in something not consulting the Word of God. And you know what? They look back and they thought, I should have consulted the Word. Made a poor decision. Paul says, I put you under oath. Have this letter read. Read it, brethren. Read it. 
I don't know if any of you remember this book. I don't know when it came out, actually. It may have been when I was in high school. Chicken Soup for the Soul. Anybody remember that? Yeah, forget that. This is superfood for the soul. Forget this chicken, chicken soup for the soul. This is superfood, brethren. This is the good stuff. Spend your time reading this book. Have this letter read. This letter. Our last phrase here. I put you under oath before the Lord. Have this letter read to all the brothers. Now, of course, he says here all the brothers, but it includes undoubtedly all the sisters. It's a, it's a general word. Oftentimes in your Bible, you will find a note a little textual note, and at the bottom they say, or brothers and sisters, you know, trying to get you to see. This includes you too. They don't have it here for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. But, but nevertheless, the point is this. It's a, it's a general term. Uh, now, a lot of times it can be for men, but, but it's the same thing as if we say all mankind, or when we say to you, brethren. It's, it's for all of you, everybody, all, all the people of God, men and women. So he's saying, brethren, I want you all to hear these words, to hear this book. And so my point is the same. Brethren, I want you to read it, to give yourself to this book. But folks, all of you, that's what he says here. I would have that this letter be read to all the brothers. Brethren, all of you need to be reading the Word of God. Reading and studying the Bible is not just for pastors. It's not just for, for super Christians. And yet many functionally live like that. They want to live off, off the word that the pastor gives or off what some other brother gives or what some sister gives them. They want to live off the food from someone else. And you know what, brethren? You can't live like that for long. This is kind of a gross analogy, but it works. <laughs> but think about this. How does a bird feed its little babies? Yeah, yeah, you all know, right? Okay, we don't have to go into great detail here. All right, but, but this, is, this is exactly what you sort of have in, in preaching. You have the bird that goes and, and eats the food and then comes back and sort of regurgitates up this food for the, for the little babies, and they eat of it. And you know what, brethren? That's okay. You can eat some of that. But eventually, what's that baby bird got to do? Got to grow up, got to fly out of that nest, and it's going to have to go find its own food, right? It's not going to grow. It's not going to be nourished if it just keeps eating off of the little bit of food that's left from its mother. Brethren, if you put in the labor to go into this book and look for good food, you won't be left to regret. You won't be. You can't keep eating pre-digested food, brethren. You got to go find your own food to eat. Let me ask you this. <laughs> who do you think has more joy in eating his dinner? Me, who when I get done with work at, you know, whatever time, 5, 6 o'clock, I'm on my way home, I can pick up a pre-packaged sandwich there at Chick-fil-A and eat it in my car as I'm on my way home? Or the guy who lives in the jungles of Amazon, he's been hunting a wild pig for two days, he finally kills it with his spear, drags it all the way back to his camp, skins it, butchers it, and cooks it in the ground for 15 hours. Who do you think has more joy eating his food? You better believe that guy does. And I don't care how much you like Chick-fil-A. And you know why he does? Because he's labored over it. That's why. It may not even taste as good as the Chick-fil-A does. I don't know. But I'll tell you what. He loves that thing way more than you love your sandwich. Because he's put work into it. Brethren, you go to this word and you labor over it that you might be fed from it. Oh, brethren you won't be left without good food. You won't be left without nourishment. And, and undoubtedly, you all have likely recognized this in your own lives. Undoubtedly, probably many of you have spent time reading the Word this week, and there's something that's there in your mind. You've been thinking about it. Something that's affected you from the Word as you've read it throughout the week. Somebody give me something. Anything that you've read throughout the week that has just... Psalms. Huh? Psalms. Okay. A lot of Psalms. What else? Psalms. Okay. What about it? It's not what I thought. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
What else? I mean, as you guys have spent time in the Word, something that has affected you. Well, the Psalms help me learn more how to pray. Okay. Question about how to pray for enemies of God. Uh, I was like, I didn't realize kind of the strong language David used. Mm -hmm. You guys undoubtedly have had these things. And probably have them now, but I recognize people are shy. They don't want to speak up. But, but as you have spent time reading the Word through this week, undoubtedly God has brought to you reality in some verse, some chapter, some something. God's brought to you some truth that you clung to, that you found incredibly nourishing to your soul. And yet, you know what? We have found it to be the case, brethren. Uh, I didn't want to do it because at the risk of making my brother feel sad. But I know it's going to be the case for me too next week. Someone name me the passage Aaron preached from last week. <laughs> okay. All right. See that? <laughs> but someone name me all the points he preached on last week. And you know what? It's going to... It's, Brethren, listen, it's going to happen to me next week too. If, if Manny stands up next week and he asks the same questions, that's the reality. And you know what? It's because, it's because we, we're going to the Lord. We try to put in the labor to bring to you food. And maybe you take something, you take something here, you take something there. But you're not going to take all of it. You can't take all of it. It's impossible, right? But, but listen, this is the idea. You go to the Word and you find food for yourself it's more sustainable. It's more sustainable. You can eat off that for a while. You go find yourself a wild pig in the meat or in, 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 the, in the woods, and you can eat that thing for a long time. But you know what? You get a little bit of regurgitated food from the mama bird. It's only going to last you a little bit. You're going to have to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. But brethren, if you go to this word and you dig in there, you will find food for the soul, and it will sustain you, and it will sustain you a long time. You've got to learn how to eat. You've got to learn how to eat by yourself. Listen, you remember the Israelites in the wilderness. God rained down manna from heaven. And they, were going to, they gathered. They gathered it up. They ate it. And most people, you know, when they talk about this situation and they liken it to the Word, what they'll typically associate it is you've got, you got to go back day after day after day. Right? You've got to go back and get the manna again the next day. You, you can't eat yesterday's manna today. You've got to eat today's manna today. It's going to stink. It's going to, get, it's going to grow worms like it says there in the text. And that's true. You've got to go to the Word today. And then tomorrow, you've got to go to the Word again tomorrow. You can't eat off yesterday's manna. You've got, to get, you've got to get your Word again today. But you know what else is true? Here's what it says. Moses said to the people, gather it, each of you. Right? He says, gather it, each of you, as much as he can eat. You know how foolish it would have been if you found one of those Israelites sitting there, he's sitting in his tent looking out, and you're like, hey man, you're going to you're gonna have to gather some manna so that you can eat. And he says, no, 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 my neighbor's gathering manna. He's going to eat. It'll be fine. He'll eat, I'll get nourished, we're all good. That would have been foolish, brethren. Would have been absolutely foolish. Not a chance. He's going to need to go out, he's going to need to gather it for himself, and he's going to need to eat or else he gets no nourishment. And then listen to this. I almost changed my whole sermon when I came to the very end, about, and I was just putting this verse in here at the very end. I almost scrapped everything. Listen, he says, Gather it, each of you, as much as he can eat. I love that. I mean, do you not just love that in regards to the word? As much as you can eat. Brethren, gather it up. I mean, come to this word and gather up as much as you can eat. This is pure manna from heaven. Lastly, this, and undoubtedly I know this. I know that you all, you want to be fruitful in the life of the church. You want to be useful to God. You want to be useful to your brethren. You want to be faithful to Christ. But folks, if you want to do that, you're going to need to be in the word. How are you going to help the weak? How are you going to press on the weary? How are you going to admonish the idle? How are you going to give a word in season, like it says in the Proverbs, if you're not getting a word in season? How are you going to help if you're not getting helped first from the word? You're going to need to put your ear to this book. You're going to need to put your nose in this book. Remember that, like Christ, 
Remember that? He had the tongue of a disciple. Why? Because he had the ear of a disciple, right? He was able to speak forth that which is good and helpful for God's people because he was, he was feeding off of every word that came from the mouth of God day by day by day. Brethren, have this letter read. Have this book read. Let's pray.